This video is to show you one way you can dissect an earthworm so that we can see its internal anatomy. I'm also going to highlight some of the interesting features um, that we might see along the way. So the earthworm I have in front of me is the common earthworm, Lumbricus terrestris. This specimen is preserved, it makes dissection a lot easier, a lot less messy. So first, let's just orientate this specimen. We want to know where we're cutting when we start dissecting. We want to know what's lying underneath our knife. Now with live specimens, it's quite obvious which the head end is. It's the way the worm is moving. The worm will be moving forwards, leading with its head and feeling its environment with its head. But obviously we can't go by movements with a preserved specimen. So instead, what I'm going to look for is this structure here called a clitellum, and here it is. So this is kind of lighter, sometimes it's slightly orangey, bulbous, raised area on the earthworm. And the head is actually much closer to the clitellum than the tail section. So I know that this is the anterior end and this is the posterior end. Now, a lot of worms that you dig up in the garden aren't sexually mature, in which case they won't have a clitellum. So we need to look at some other features that we can use to help us orientate the earthworm. So if we look at the posterior section, we can see the posterior end is slightly flattened compared to the anterior end. And we can see that the, actually the, the posterior end actually ends in an anus at the end there. It's quite different to the, to the head end, which ends in a structure called a prostomium. The prostomium is this lip-like structure which overhangs the peristomium, and the peristomium is where you'll find the worm's mouth. If the worm has suffered some kind of injury in the past when both the head and the tail end have been simultaneously lopped off, it is quite possible that the worm will have developed two heads at both ends. So it's worth checking that you actually do have an anus on that um, posterior end. So the fact that worms have a mouth and an anus, so they have two separate openings, one for the intake of food and one for expelling waste products, means that worms have a complete digestive system. So now we know which is the anterior and the posterior end, we need to know which is the dorsal and the ventral surface. Now if you roll this worm over, we can see that the colour changes. One side is darker than the other. Now this lighter surface is the ventral surface and I know that because there's a number of features on this ventral surface. So here above the clitellum closer to the head end are two pores. These are at the level of segment 15. These are the male pores and it's from here that sperm will be expelled when you have two worms mating. Another feature of the ventral surface is that it's slightly rougher than the dorsal surface. So if I run my finger just down that ventral surface, it actually feels quite tacky, kind of stubbly and rough. And that's because it's covered with little hook-shaped hair-like structures called chitin, which help to anchor the worm to the surface when it's moving. So the back part won't move and the front part can thrust forward. Not all the chitin are the same. These ones here to the side of the clitellum protrude slightly more and that's because they have an important function in helping to keep um, worms together when they are mating. Another important feature of the earthworm is that you'll notice the whole earthworm is segmented. Each segment is defined by these two furrows either side which are called the intersegmental furrows. The segmentation in earthworm is what we call metameric because basically the segments are identical to each other. So all the segments posterior to the clitellum will contain, for example, the intestine, nephridia, muscles that are involved in locomotion, ganglia and chitin. So they're all pretty much identical. Whereas the segments anterior to the clitellum do vary a little bit more, which we'll see when we open up the worm. One final thing to note before we actually start our dissection is that we're looking at the respiratory surface. So this is where gas exchange takes place. If we look at the fresh specimens, we can see that the worms are quite moist. And this is because the clitellum secretes a mucus which will help keep that surface moist. And it needs to be moist so that gas exchange can occur. So worms don't have any gills. In fact, looking at this worm, there aren't really any obvious external adaptations for gas exchange at all. The body surface is quite smooth. But if we look at the live worms, we can see they're very active and these muscular movements would help gas exchange. So we're now ready to begin opening up the worm. I'm going to start by pinning the worm down. So I'm going to put one pin through the first segment and I'm going to put one pin through the last segment. 
It's really important that I take my time and make sure the worm isn't twisted. I'm not pushing the pins straight down, but I'm actually putting them in at an angle, and that's to keep them away from my hands when I'm dissecting, so I have plenty of space here to, uh, to do my dissection. So as I say, we need to make sure this worm is um, got the dorsum on the top. It's so easy for these worms to, to become uh, twisted and it can really mess up the dissection. So take your time, get your worm nice and straight, make sure there's no twists in it so you can be sure that you are looking at the dorsal surface all the way down the worm. Now it's really helpful at this stage to set up markers for segments 5, 10 and 15. And you do this by counting. So if I count back from segment 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I'm going to stick a pin just next to segment 5. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now I'm not sticking it into the worm, just sticking it to the side of the worm. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And I know that's 15 as well because... I can just see the male paw underneath when I look there. So those are my, my reference pins. To get a feel of the dissection, I'm going to start off by opening up the posterior part of the worm. To do this, I need to turn the worm round because I'm right-handed and I work in a right-to-left direction. So first of all, I just need to make a short, small incision just posterior to the clitellum to get my scissors in. So I'm cutting very shallowly and I'm going to extend this cut until it's about two centimetres long. Then I want to pin one side of the worm. So we take the, draw the skin back and you just want to just pin it down. Pop a pin in there. You'll see there's lots of scepter that's holding the worm down, holding the worm in there. I want to cut those scepter with a scalpel, bring back the other surface of the worm. So again, using my scalpel to just cut the, the scepter that's tethering the skin to the worm. Draw it right back and pop a pin in the other side as well. Continue down the worm, snipping again, keep it very shallow, about two centimeters at a time, certainly no more than that. Oops, I think I've just caught the gut slightly there. Not, not a huge problem with a preserved specimen, but it just means I have to be a little bit more careful. So I cut a little bit deeply there. You can see I've ruptured the gut, and the gut, of course, is full of, of humus that the earthworm has been eating. And whilst I'm dissecting, I can actually see the dorsal blood vessel uh, running along the top of the worm there. And I'm using that as a guide. I know that dorsal blood vessel needs to be uppermost when I'm doing my dissection. So now I've opened up the posterior part of the worm, I want to use exactly the same techniques for opening up the anterior part of the worm, taking extra care to keep all of my cuts really, really superficial. Now I'm going to use my reference pins so I know that this segment here is segment 15. So I'm going to, st I've taken the pin out but I'm going to stick it back into segment 15 so I, I can keep an eye on where that segment 15 actually is. Same with segment 10. 
again in just a bit I'm going to take the the reference marker out and I'm going to use it by pinning it into the worm well you can actually see here I don't know if the camera's picking this up but the actual cuticle is just coming away you see this uh, little skinny bit just here um, that's actually a bit of cuticle because the the worm actually is covered in cuticle Gonna pop a couple more pins in the top and then that's your earthworm opened up and we're ready to have a look at the structures. So what can we see? So starting with the sea loam, which is this space between the body wall and the gut. This is normally filled with fluid, coelomic fluid, and this space is important because it allows the body wall and the gut to move independently. It also acts as a hydrostatic skeleton so that the worm can actually push through the soil. Let's move on to the digestive system, and this is really obvious. It's this blacky brown tube running the whole length of the worm, and it's this colour because worms eat humus, and it's still there inside the digestive tract, which, is, which you can see where I've nicked the tract. Now at the most anterior end of the worm we'll have the mouth, the pharynx, and all that's quite muscular and it draws the food into the esophagus and that's all hidden behind these structures here which we'll come to in just a bit. Then the, the food moves along to the crop which is this sac-like chamber which actually feels quite soft and extensible. And then we have the gizzard where the food is mixed and ground up and this is quite thick-walled and it's quite hard, actually quite hard that. So all of that is the foregut, and then next we have the intestine, which is by far the, the largest part of the digestive system. This is where digestion and the absorption of nutrients takes place, so all of this is the midgut. You'll notice that the gut's all in one line, you know, there's no coiling. Um, given the, the, the body shape of the worm, there isn't really any, any room for coiling. Um, but they do have an adaptation that does increase the surface area available for digestion and absorption and that's called a tiflazole which runs right along the whole length of the gut which is an infolding of the, um, in the intestine inside. And then we have a very short hindgut and the anus right at the end here. So now looking at the reproductive organs, now the most obvious part of the reproductive system are these three pairs of seminal vesicles. There's a very large posterior seminal vesicle, a smaller middle seminal vesicle, and a smaller still anterior seminal vesicle. And that's, these contain uh, developing sperm. Now you may notice of similar colour, you'll see these seminal receptacles, which are these little round structures here. And that's where the sperm will be deposited by a um, a worm with which it has mated. So those are the sperm storage chambers. So let's look at the circulatory system. So earthworms have a closed circulatory system, so in other words blood circulates in vessels, and we can see the dorsal vessel just running along the dorsal surface of the digestive tract, and it runs all the way down to the end. This carries blood forwards. Now if we roll the digestive tract back, we can see the ventral vessel. Roll it back, the ventral vessel is just, just there. You can see it's actually running with the, the nerve cord and we're going to look at that in more detail in a minute. So you've got the ventral vessel there and that conveys blood backwards. So you have blood being conveyed forwards in the dorsal vessel and backwards in a ventral vessel. Now this circulation is driven by two things. Firstly, peristaltic contractions actually in this dorsal vessel which take place about every two to three seconds but also by pumping in the aortic arches, which we'll have a look now. Aortic arches are contractile vessels which act a bit like pseudo-hearts. Now to see the aortic arches, we need to move the seminal uh, vesicles and the seminal receptacles just to the side. So to see the aortic arches, we need to move aside the seminal vesicles, and that's what I've done. I've just pushed them to the side. Some of the seminal vesicle has actually just broken off, but that, that doesn't matter now. Um, so the aortic arches, there are actually five of them in this species. One, two, three, four, five. And there'll be five on the other side as well. So 
we want to look at the nervous system now. Now, earthworms don't have a true brain, but what they do have is a mass of neuronal cell bodies just at the anterior end called the suprapharyngeal ganglia. And it actually lies on top of the pharynx in the third segment. So I'm going to use my reference pin at segment five. And I'm just going to clear away some of this top structure here so I can actually see the suprapharyngeal ganglia. Now we want to see the ventral nerve cord which runs the length of the body on the ventral surface and to do this I need to roll the gut backwards. So I'm just going to grip the gut just, just behind the clitellum and lift it up and basically just cut it, cut it away, roll it back so we can see the structures underneath it. And next to that ventral blood vessel, we should see the ventral nerve cord. So this ready colored vessel here is the ventral blood vessel. And just underneath it here, you can see the nerve cord. And obviously these run the entire length of the worm. I've just uncovered it in this region. And they're very fragile. So take your time when dissecting to reveal these structures. And that concludes your earthworm dissection.